I think one of the best ways to explain why a narrative does or doesn't work is to use film as a reference point. It's hard to do this with the individual parts of language, grammar, sentence structure, syntax, but when those elements are combined into a scene, our brain very naturally makes an image of what we read, and so the best way to explain what to do, and what not to do, is with a visual medium. I believe that film has mastered the art of how we process information, and that novelists can and should take the hard-learned lessons of that medium and bring them into our own. One of those lessons is the Kuleshov effect, a film editing effect demonstrated by Soviet filmmaker Lev Kuleshov in the 1910s and 1920s. It is a mental phenomenon by which viewers derive more meaning from the interaction of two sequential shots than from a single shot in isolation. An example would be if you see a man looking into the camera and then show an image of children playing, you assume that man to have been watching the children playing. They weren't necessarily, they may not have been filmed on the same day, but your brain makes that leap. This is a method filmmakers have used for almost 100 years to hack the way our brains process information. Let's keep that in mind as we read the following passage from Kemp's Army, an upcoming World War II novel by Sam Bauer. The safe door creaked open, revealing the room beyond. It had a small desk with a pad of paper covered in immaculate calculations laying neatly next to a small selection of pens. Wooden filing cabinets covered the windowless walls. Placing his German phrase book on the table, Kemp opened a drawer and pulled out a file, not noticing that the embers of his cigarette fell onto the exposed papers. That's a fine paragraph, grammatically speaking. There's nothing wrong with the phrasing, or the grammar, or the spelling, or anything. And yet, something's not quite right about it. It's jarring for some reason when it doesn't mean to be, and I think it's because it breaks the illusion created by the Kuleshov effect. So let's break this down. We start with Kemp opening the safe door. The safe door creaked open, revealing the room beyond. You see this as a shot of the door opening, or as a shot of Kemp seeing the door open. Either is fine. We then cut to a description of the room inside the safe. It had a small desk with a pad of paper. This makes sense. Because of the Kuleshov effect, we assume that what we are being shown is what Kemp is seeing. We are being shown him opening the safe, and now we are being shown what he sees inside it. Perfect. But then we zoom in to what's on the paper. With a pad of paper covered in immaculate calculations laying neatly next to a small selection of pens. This is jarring to the reader, because there's no way for Kemp to have seen this. As far as the reader knows, Kemp is still outside the safe peering in, and this shot is from his point of view, so he can't be seeing the calculations on the page. It's an impossible detail, so we have to assume the camera has zoomed in, and that we're not seeing what Kemp is seeing. But then, the camera zooms back out to take in the rest of the room, as though we were back in Kemp's point of view. Wooden filing cabinets covered the windowless walls. Then, we cut directly to Kemp interacting with the table. Placing his German phrase book on the table, Kemp opened a drawer and pulled out a file. We didn't see Kemp enter the room. Because of the Kuleshov effect, we assumed that the description of the room, impossible as it was at times, was him looking at the room from outside where we left him. When the text returns to him and he's at the table, it's like he just teleported there. This is an excellent example of perfect prose placed in the wrong order, in such a way that it jolts the reader out of the experience of the text, and forces them to try and figure out what's going on on their own, and it's the type of thing we want to avoid. However, we can rearrange and add text to clarify this. Okay, the first thing to realize is that this shouldn't be one paragraph. It should be several, as the story cuts to zoom in on several different things that we should draw attention to. Think of paragraph jumps like cuts in a movie, and then figure out their placement. The safe door creaked open, revealing the room beyond. That's a perfect setup, and it doesn't need to be changed. It is, however, the end of that cut, so it should be the end of that paragraph. But now that single shot sentence looks a little lonely there, as its own paragraph. So we'll add some description. The safe door creaked open, revealing the room beyond. Stale air wafted in from the hidden room, mixing and mingling with the coppery tang of the air that had surrounded Kemp. He took a deep breath of it, then stepped forward through the safe that hadn't been safe at all. The bit about the stale air isn't important. It's a flourish, a part of the magic trick to try to disguise what's being done to the reader. 
it could even be taken out, but I like it there. It sets up the next bit of business, however, when Kemp steps forward into the room within the safe. This sets up the motion that will be completed when Kemp arrives at the desk. So now that's out of the way. The room had a small desk in its center, of the type that were popular 20 years prior, carved from a single mammoth hunk of tree, as though it had grown fully formed out of the concrete floor. It had a single pad of paper on it, perfectly arranged in its center, its edges parallel to the edges of the desk. There was a small selection of pens next to it. The walls around the desk were windowless, lined with wooden filing cabinets, at precise intervals. On the first go around, the desk wasn't placed in the room. I pictured it in the middle, where it would have been best framed by the safe, but that could be very wrong, so I add its placement to make sure all the readers are seeing the same thing. All the text describing the desk is superfluous. It could be anything, but it focuses our attention on the desk to make it more natural when we describe what's on it. We then again cut to the room surrounding the desk, but instead of cutting to the walls like we did the first time, we set them up in relation to the desk with the line, The walls around the desk. Everything is oriented around the desk. It is the focus of the reader's mental eye, because it is the focus of our prose. Slowly, placing one foot in front of the other, Kemp stepped up to the desk. He reached out and pressed the spine of his German phrasebook against the pad, applying pressure and using that pressure to turn the pad around to face him. The pad of paper was covered with immaculate calculations. All of this is flourish. None of it matters. All we needed was Kemp stepping up to the desk, but we added the extra detail of the paper facing the opposite way because Kemp still facing the other side of the desk cements the room in reality to the reader. It also draws out the reveal of what's on the page, making it seem more important. Kemp placed the phrase book on the table, walked around it, and opened one of its drawers. There were files inside and he pulled one out, not noticing that the embers from his cigarette fell onto the exposed papers. This is actually the start of a completely new action and didn't belong in the original paragraph, so we move it down to its own paragraph and the scene continues. So here's what the new scene reads like. The safe door creaked open revealing the room beyond. Stale air wafted in from the hidden room, mixing and mingling with the coppery tang of the air that had surrounded Kemp. He took a deep breath of it, then stepped forward through the safe that hadn't been safe at all. The room had a small desk in its center, of the type that were popular twenty years prior, carved from a single mammoth hunk of tree, as though it had grown fully formed out of the concrete floor. It had a single pad of paper on it, perfectly arranged in its center, its edges parallel to the edges of the desk. There was a small selection of pens next to it. The walls around the desk were windowless, lined with wooden filing cabinets at precise intervals. Slowly, placing one foot in front of the other, Kemp stepped up to the desk. He reached out and pressed the spine of his German phrasebook against the pad, applying pressure and using that pressure to turn the pad around to face him. The pad of paper was covered with immaculate calculations. By focusing on where the text is placing the camera in the scene and how that placement relates to the point of view and the Kuleshov effect, we've made this scene more diegetic and less jarring to the reader. It makes sense in the visual language that our brains process the text as, influenced by 100 plus years of film history. And from a writing standpoint, it turns 68 words into 224 words, tripling the word count of the scene in a natural, necessary way. It's changes like this that are how your first draft becomes a novel. Thanks guys for watching that episode of the Write Project Podcast, and a big thank you to Sam Bauer for allowing us to dissect that paragraph of his. I don't know why, but I find that the analytical side of my brain and the creative side of my brain can't function as once at once, so when I'm editing someone else's work, the analytical part of my brain just starts up. That's when I got the idea for this episode. We couldn't film with Amanda and Ellen this week because some of the weather here in Newfoundland, but I wanted to let you know that it's very appreciated that you write, uh, like, and subscribe. You can check us out here along with all our other videos and books and all that other stuff. If you want to support us, you can support us on Patreon, which is a great site that allows people to support other creatives and stuff like that. It's for as little as a dollar a month, and it's a huge help. The sponsor of this video and all the videos of the Write Project podcast is Fiction First Used Books. They're a small used bookstore out of Annapolis Valley, Nova Scotia, located at 1506 Megan Drive.
They have an amazing selection of RPG books and graphic novels, fantasy and science fiction books. This month, I want to bring your attention to Justice League Dark Times, which should be showing up here. It's a great graphic novel. They just got a whole bunch of graphic novels in. So while quantities last, this one is $20. Thank you for watching the Right Project podcast, and never look back.